They were going, I'm glad y'all, do what? Oh, okay, I'm glad y'all made it. Uh, sorry about the short notice. Uh, we, I found out about, I think it was Monday, was it Joe? Probably yeah, Monday. I got an email from Joel that said that Marjean had, was at the curves and she overheard people talking about our Culpepper's being closed. Right. So she called Joe, Joe called Culpepper's and they said, yep, they had about a week's notice. So I tried as quick as I could, Joe had called here and they said they could accommodate us today on this Wednesday, but that they have a group that meets every other Wednesday and so that would interfere with our Wednesday, Wednesdays eventually. I think November and December are already booked. So after tonight, we're going to be the third Tuesday, because Tuesday is available. Um, we're very fortunate to have found a place so quickly. Uh, like I said, a week's notice had it not been for Joe, and he said, I called Culpepper's in Kirkwood, they're available. It's like in Russian. He goes, and for Wednesday, but it was just this Wednesday. So here we are. <laughs> we, Always an adventure, huh? <laughs> it's a little bit closer for some and a little bit farther for others, but it, it seems like it's nice and quiet, kind of nice and private and quiet. Um, we don't have that noise, so I don't need that speaker, so I don't have the problem of feedback, which now it's one less problem I have to try and solve. So tonight we're gonna have uh, Dave Marler. Um, let's see, what time we got here? Just before he comes out, I'll do an it's introduction. About quarter to seven. Oh, okay. I'll do. Yes. I've got it. Um, well, Dave. Dave Marler. Let me see here. Might as well do it now. Are you? No way. First of all, before I get into, um, I'll most of you know Dave Marler. Before I get into that, um, a little bit of what's been going on in the state of Missouri. <laughs> We've had the usual amount of, of, of um, strange balls of light. They're getting a lot more frequent. But to top that off, in the month of July, we had two cattle mutilations on the same ranch. This is not too far from Warrensburg. How many? Two on the same ranch. One was, I believe, the 8th of July. And then while um, I was at the MUFON Symposium, and my brother happened to be there for two days. He was teaching the animal mutilation class. Uh, we got a call from Margie K, our assistant state director from the Kansas City area, and there was a second cat mutilation on the same ranch on the 17th. She found it the morning of the 18th and gave Margie an immediate call, and it came to us. <clears throat> Margie and I went out there, and I mean, it's, it's, a, it's definitely not predator. Um, and the, the, the rancher was so disturbed by it, she went on, she's on YouTube talking about it and uh, they had the police out there, they had a veterinarian out there. There, there was, I went out, that's why I've got a little bit of a cold, but I went out the, the uh, weekend after I got back from um, Vegas and we went out and investigated the site. And so, um, now we, well, the interesting thing too um, was that the second one was on the 17th of July, which was a, a Thursday, and on the following Wednesday, uh, President Obama went to Warrensburg, and this ranch is 15 miles away. So that was just kind of interesting that he could have gone anywhere in the world, but he went to Illinois and then went right over to Whiteman Air Force Base, flew in there, and then traveled down and had some. They were introducing um, students at a college and school was out on the, um, uh, I, well, it was the Wednesday after, let's see, the mutilation was on the 17th, so it was the following Wednesday of July. So there wasn't a school session, so they got kids that are going to high school and they're taking college classes. They got college cl uh, credits at this college, they got college credits through high school at this college. And so, they gathered them up and put orange t-shirts on them and had them all up there, but I haven't had a chance because we had this whole thing happen. I ended up sick and then we had this whole thing happen with losing our meeting place. I've been concentrating on trying to get all this organized, but I want to go back and check and find out how far in advance was this this uh, meeting with the, you know, with the president and these students. <clears throat> it seems just awful funny that you know two animal relations and the president shows up in Warrensburg, Missouri. So, 
Uh, Margie's going to be here, hopefully here, hopefully not by Skype, but I'm going to get Margie here in October. She's already scheduled, and she's going to be talking about all the animal mutilations in the area because she's found out about several more of them. Um, I believe we had one at the beginning of the year also um, in the Kandir, well, it was uh, south of uh, Independence. So they're picking up again. We have to, and our activity is picking up. It seems like we're heading in the same direction as we did in the 1970s uh, UFO, whoop, UFO flat. Can you, can you hear me here? Sure. Okay, there we go. I've been talking without even the microphone. Uh, so we're heading kind of in the same um, direction as the, the 1970s UFO flat. That a lot of that started in the early 70s with um, animal mutilations and um, here we go again. Then it went from there to craft sightings. There were a lot of animal mutilations. Most of you knew that Linda Moulton Howe had investigated a lot of those back in the early 70s, and they started, she went to the San Luis Valley, but most of them started in Missouri. Um, I've even read reports to where there were chickens that were found mutilated, dogs, sheep. So it's gonna be another interesting year. Um, so who, who all here, who went to the MUFON Symposium to Vegas? Oh, just Lisa and me? Uh, oh, and you, you should tell them what they missed. Oh, well, I'm going to show them. Y'all missed Area 51. They took us right to the gate of Area 51. It was awesome. They took a great big bus. They parked all the way at the end of the road. They came up, turned around, 50 people on the bus. And actually, we were the fourth bus. We were the only ones that went at night, you know, dusk. But they, they pulled up. Um, turned off the side road, went way down the road, so we saw the bus way off a little bit in the distance. They go, okay, now you're going to walk back. They don't want to be that close. So I'm going to really quickly show you a couple pictures of, of uh, Area 51. It was, it was really cool. Oh, let's see if I can figure out here. Let's see. Oh, wait a minute. I always do this wrong. Um, Manage. Okay, this, this first picture was just, whoop, the first one was a gas station we stopped at. This is just area mountains. Whoop, let me go back. That was just, that was taken out of the bus uh, window. That's some kind of, the light was just coming down strange. This is being the extraterrestrial, extraterrestrial highway. Um, there we go, Rachel, 40 miles. <laughs> so we're coming up on, on Rachel, Nevada. This is just a gift shop. These are going awful fast. Oh, okay, so this one here, if I can get this to go slower. This one here um, is everybody walking up to the gate. Um, that's the guardhouse. Uh, that's me standing in front of the sign that says no photography. No photography. This is the, um, the sensor, so if your hand ends up over the sensor, we all go to jail. <laughs> this is going awful fast here, let's see. Okay. Uh, warning, no trespassing, um, basically unauthorized person, not permitted. This is the sign again, the photography sign. I'm gonna figure out how to get this to go slower. Okay, there's the gate, and that's the farther gate, and to the right are the, the guard houses. This one here, if I can get this to stop, get this to stop. Whoop, that might do it. Okay, they told us if we put, <clears throat> well, maybe not. If we put one finger over the top of this gate, we were going to jail. And they said they they had no sense of humor at all. Um, that that what they stop it here. Maybe if I look, I can say if I hold it, but that won't do it. Um, that, that basically the sheriff would come out and um, he would, he had no sense of humor, the sheriff would come out, we'd be arrested and everybody in the bus would be detained, so you don't put your hand over the gate. That's just a sunset. Um, there's a sunset <clears throat> over the gates at Area 51. And the gatehouse is a little bit closer, I was hoping I was going to catch somebody in there, but I, I don't think I did. But this is that that's how desolate it is, and I can't believe they let us get this close. There is a the camera, this thing, we all waved at it. 
One guy wanted to read it, and I said, no, no, yeah, that's not going to work. Um, another sunset. It got to where finally they were, the guardhouse was taking pictures. Oh, there I am, I got my finger next to it, but not over. <laughs> and finally that big camera turned around and they were watching the sunset. Quit watching us. Look at this, how close. Somebody built a campfire that close. So you know, nice. let me go back to that. You know how aggravating that is to have them right there camping all night. There's nothing these guys can do about it. <laughs> that was pretty cool. This is how dark it was when we finally left, and they brought in another one of the. Oh, crap. I don't. Know. Let's see here. Might be better off just to switch pictures. Let me go back one. Um. Thought this is supposed to. That's okay. I talk to myself a lot. But anyway, that this is how dark it was when when we were there. They brought in another white truck that they brought in so quick we couldn't get a picture of it because they were nervous that we were there and it was actually dark. Oh, so now it stays there. Okay. This is, um, okay, so who has seen the movie Paul? Did y'all see it? Yeah, look at, they, they actually, this is autographed pictures that are there in the little alien movie. Yeah, they, they, so they actually filmed there because they took pictures of the actors and had them framed. This is the inside, so you can see the bar where, where the, the, the two British guys sat and got waited on. And it, I don't know, I think it looks a little bit smaller than what it did on TV. Oh yeah, there's the restrooms, the men and the women's had aliens on them. I thought that was cute. <laughs> And they gave us a slideshow. Um, it was one hour long, and they told us all about the history of Area 51. That was part of our tour. It was a pretty good tour because we got um, the whole thing, the bus ride, the, um, you know, we were over at the gate of Area 51 for an hour. Then we came here and had a buffet dinner at, at the Little Ailey Inn, and saw the extraterrestrial sign for a photo op, and then went over to the black mailbox, and the, the whole thing was 150 I mean, I'm sorry, $105. So then we got our money's worth, because they were selling them for about, 100, I think it was $175, he said, what he usually charges. So while they're in there listening to the history of Area 51, I was outside taking pictures. This is the outside. By the time we got there, it was dark. So I, I spent the hour taking video of the sky, hoping I was going to catch something, but I don't think I did. But that's kind of the sky would look kind of eerie, it's kind of a blurry picture. But and there's the mailbox, the black mailbox, which is actually white. <laughs> and then this this last <coughs> sorry, this last picture. Somehow they took a picture of Jan Harzan, that's our new international director of Buffon and me, and managed, both, managed to make both of us look fat. So, <laughs> I look like I got a double chin even. <laughs> so, and that's the first thing Jan said, he's from California, he goes, I look fat. I said, you aren't supposed to say that. <laughs> the only man I've ever heard that looks at pictures and says, delete him, I look fat. So I think that's the end of the slideshow, but I thought you might enjoy a little bit of <clears throat> okay, how are we doing for time? Oh, good, we got a few minutes. Okay, I'll whoop, talk a little bit about Dave. I gotta read this, I have terrible eyes. Um, whoop. Almost, well, a lot of people here know who Dave is. Dave's been to our meeting. He spoke about triangles, uh, triangle craft before, probably three years ago, came to one of our meetings. <clears throat> um, he's um, formerly of Fairmont City, remembers that as a child of five, he had to stay home with his mother in 1973 while his father took his brothers and sister to investigate UFO activity in Piedmont, Missouri. Wow. Um, Piedmont is the area where they had all this activity in the 70s. <clears throat> now, 40 years later, after many investigations of zones, he's, of the zone, he's written the book Triangular, Triangular UFOs, an Estimate of the Situation. And I went ahead, because I asked Dave to send me some autograph like I usually do, except that Dave um, had sold all his books out. So I went ahead and bought these um, myself. 
And if you want, well, they're not autographed, but they're they're what I paid for. Well, basically, they're 15 cents more than what I paid for. I paid fifth, with tax and shipping, everything came to 15.85. But I'm selling them for 16 because I don't want to deal with the change, and the extra 15 cents will be a donation to move on. But the books are here, and it's going to give us an incentive when Dave comes back in town, because he still has family in the area. We're going to get to come to one of our meetings. I'll let you know in plenty of time. You can bring your books back, and we'll get them to autograph them for us. <coughs> and then, you know, hopefully you'll bring some more, too. Um, <coughs> let's see. Oh, and you know what? He, basically, he's written the book with the purpose of placing focus on triangular UFO sighting reports. Uh, Marler graduated from Althoff. Catholic High School in Belleville and from Southern Illinois University in Edwardsville with a degree in psychology. In 1990, he became a field investigator training with the Mutual UFO Network, Move On, eventually rising to becoming Illinois State Director. He's now an independent investigator and in his spare time, um, oh, in his spare time, and he, he lives in Albuquerque, New Mexico, works for a large medical company. And um, I believe what he said was he's gonna be speaking to us from El Paso, Texas. <coughs> He also speaks at conferences and meetings, and in 2012 was talking about the 2000 uh, UFO Metro East sighting. Um, he spoke about that at the Ozark UFO conference in Eureka Springs. And after his talk, people were asking him why did he write a book. So on the flight home, he decided he was going to write a book, and there it is. So um, we're going to have Dave here that's going to tell us a little bit about his book and about his research and uh, why he believes a lot of these triangular craft indeed aren't something that are ours or the government's, but they, they are something that's um, extraterrestrial or, I don't know, has, who's, who's read his book? Has anybody got his book yet? See, so you read it? I did not. You what? Oh, that's right. <laughs> you emailed me that. Yeah, I read it. Oh, I'm sorry, I've been, I've been sick. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm or well, worse, I can actually say I got sick on an animal mutilation investigation, <coughs> caught a cold. So, have we got any questions about anything before I call Dave up? Any announcements? Uh, so, I should probably remind everybody. <laughs> what I should probably remind everybody is, um, and if you have trouble, we're going to have Dave on the screen. So, we have people coming in. We still have some chairs over here where you can see the screen. From, I'm not sure how well you can see from over there, but <clears throat> we, um, if you haven't heard already, because I've got people still coming in, um, I had about, I, I found out a week ago Monday that um, our Culpepper's was closing permanently. And um, Marjean, thank you, she was the one that overheard at Curves, <laughs> called, called uh, Joe, and Joe called our Culpepper's, and they said, yeah, they are closing. Then he emailed me. And in the meantime, he had called this Culpeppers and said, are you available? And so I came, he, and Joe emailed me and said, yes, it is available for Wednesday. So I came rushing right down here and talked to the manager, Ryan, and, um, excuse me, and he said, yeah, we are available for Wednesday, but this Wednesday only because they have a group that is here every other Wednesday. And so when you don't do like the first and the third and the second and the fourth, when you do every other, eventually it's going to fall on the third Wednesday. And I believe November and December already fell on our Wednesday. So he said it would just work out better for everybody rather than changing dates back and forth if we did the third Tuesday. So originally, uh, before 2009, actually probably started maybe in 2010, um, we, we originally were the third Tuesday, so now we're back to the third Tuesday again. I uh, hope that works out for everybody, and I hope this place does. It seems like it's really nice. Um, they're really nice people here. They, they're working with us. The first thing they do when you get a place to hold a meeting is um, they say, well, we'd like to have a set menu because there's so many people. And I said, oh, you know, the other Culpeppers worked it out with us to where we just had an open menu. We didn't have like five or six things to pick from. And I explained to them that we come in gradually, that we don't all show up at 6.30, so it's not a nightmare. So I appreciate that too, that everybody, we get people that slowly come in and we'll have someone, people that even come in at 7, 7.30. Um, and, and so they agreed. So thank you to Culpeppers that they agreed to keep their open menu and not limit us to just a few items. Um, I guess, so any announcements? 
Joe, you've got a new meeting place too? Joe, do you have a do you have a new meeting place too? Yes. Yes. We are now meeting the third Sunday of each month at the Brunswick Zone Bowling Alley uh, at Doherty Ferry in Leech. And we've we've been able to go back to the time the kind of time slot that we used to on Sunday. And uh, from two to four. So uh Bless you. Bless you. So very, very another they're very interesting meeting. What? Uh, I'd like to just say one real quick thing. Sure. Uh, on August twenty second, next Tuesday, Mars, the planet Wait, Mars. August twenty second is tomorrow. Oh, I'm sorry, the twenty seventh. Oh, next okay. Tuesday, yeah. Uh, Mars will be the closest that to Earth that it will ever be in our lifetime, and will not be this close again. Uh, they say that if it's a clear night, it may look as big as the moon when you look up in the sky. So I just wanted to pass that on. It's next Tuesday night on the 27th. Uh, they look as, maybe as bright as the moon. Yeah, we had someone say that one time before. Back in Colorado, uh, well back, I think, four or five years ago, the moon was closer than it was ever, ever going to be. And I heard people say that too, and I was out there to see it, and it, it was big but it doesn't look as close it's as bright and as clear as the moon but it, it's not actually as big as close we and we were in hooper colorado when we saw it and we were able to see the polar caps on the top and the bottom yeah, yeah if it was that big run. yeah, yeah. It, it, it's yeah and i heard that too on the internet and they they say that but it's it's not unfortunately or fortunately maybe <laughs> Oh, where are we looking? Where do you remember where we were looking for Mars? What what's part of the sky? North, south, east, west? Uh, I don't know. I, yeah. I can. I'll find that out in email because I just got. It's Deborah Bird. It's her website, and she's sending me all the updates on everything that's going on, and I'll I'll email everybody that. I don't know. You'd probably do better to look online and say Mars is its, at its closest. Where can I find it? And that would probably be the quickest way. I just get on and Google everything and just ask a question. Yeah, and before we leave here tonight, I'm, I'm sure somebody will do that <laughs> and, and and tell you exactly what time and where. And did anybody get to catch any of the meteor shower? Because hopefully it's not as this the sighting of Mars isn't as bad as the meteor shower was. The meteor shower was awful. Oh, so nothing. Oh, you're not even. One night was cloudy. Yeah. And then the other two nights, I stood out there for like an hour, an hour and a half. It's on nothing. I had one space that that was like from there to there in the sky, a big circle, and I stood out there and watched for an hour, and I saw five, but they were so faint, and they That's were. Fabulous. That was on um Mon on the Monday of the sighting. Yeah. Of the, and, and I was someplace really, well, supposedly clear on Saturday and Sunday, and then it was clear all day, and then it clouded up at night. Um, and they were greenish. The best sighting that I had was on that Tuesday. I don't, was that, it wasn't last Tuesday, but the Tuesday sighting, I was sitting, I gave up. I was sitting on my couch, and it was about 11 o'clock at night, and I've got these big um, atrium windows. And everything that I did see was greenish, and I think it had to do with the atmosphere. I heard about green asteroids and meteors and stuff before. And I'm sitting on my couch, and I saw this thing come across with lights on in my family room. It came across the sky, big old uh, green ball of light streaked all the way across the sky, heading from west to east. And I watched it, and I thought, well, that's the best one I've seen. And I went even outside. It probably would have been better outside. And then I went outside and looked, and it was totally cloudy outside. I mean, total cloud cover. So this thing was so bright and so it low, clouds, yeah. it showed through the clouds. Yeah. I thought it was pretty awesome, awesome, but that was the best one I saw. It was on Tuesday night by accident. Mm -hmm. So yeah, hopefully the, the viewing of Mars, Mars will be better because the last few meteor showers that we've had, I haven't seen anything, I've, nothing but clouds. I think the astronomical gods are <laughs> messing with us. <laughs> We're not seeing anything. Okay, I'm gonna try and get a hold of Dave again, and hopefully this will this will work out. Um, Skype sometimes if you talk a little bit fast, your your it's like a Japanese movie. You know, your mouth doesn't meet up with your voice, but all the information's there. So let's give it a try.
The best argument we can make is the historical argument and looking at the fact that we have credible, reputable individuals, which as I state in the book, the, the, the January 5th case even in Belgium with the gendarmes that report these objects. In our society, we deem these people credible enough to provide testimony, to put someone away for a criminal act. And then we have a double standard though. If they report seeing the UFO to many people, suddenly they're not credible. But yet, the gendarmes, the police officers that saw this on January 5th, 2000, after they reported this UFO, they still had jobs. Uh, the police department still deemed them to be credible. So we have credible witnesses that, like I said, in any other context, could lock someone away in, in jail based on their testimony. And we, we have to stand up and take notice. Now, Belgium and Southern Illinois had uh, police officers as the primary witnesses in the event. But in reviewing the historical information, uh, we talked about Belgium. The Belgian military obviously investigated the uh, wave of sightings over their country from 89 to 1991. What I found, though, in reviewing the historical information is in 1972, over the same area of Belgium, there was an earlier wave of triangular UFOs that was documented and investigated by the same investigative agency that at the time was known as SOPEX, basically the Belgian equivalent of MUFON at the time. And it was interesting because the UFOs that were being reported from 89 to 91 matched reports and matched the area in which they were seen to the 1972 wave. And then going back even further, if, if we look at the Danish Defense Intelligence Network, they were investigating the wave of large triangular UFOs over Denmark from 1957, November of 1957 to 1958. And what's interesting about November 1957 is in addition to uh, the Danish Defense Intelligence Service investigating these reports, I also had a report over uh, Indonesia that was written up by one of the, the major publications there that described a large triangular UFO. And closer to home in the Project Blue Book files in November of 1957, there were triangular UFOs being seen along the Illinois and Wisconsin border which is documented in the Air Force Project Blue Book files. So again, these aren't just random sightings here and there. And, you know, in investigating UFOs, obviously UFOs and steady bullet tests come in all shapes and sizes, right? <laughs> we know that from investigating and reviewing hundreds of cases. But uh, sometimes as in investigators and researchers, we're trying to find the answer to the UFO mystery, and we're looking at this huge tapestry of saucers uh, tubular objects, triangular UFOs, cattle mutilations, they, you know, the, the crash at Roswell, um, crop circles. And you look at all that information, and it, it's almost mind numbing trying to make sense out of it. So what I thought what I would do, rather than venture off into these other areas, let's take, let's take some laser precision and focus specifically on UFO sightings, but more specifically, just reports of triangular UFOs, and let's see what kind of details and patterns we can glean from the information. And what was really amazing, I thought there might be earlier reports. I didn't realize how many earlier reports actually existed. And a lot of these were from newspapers, they were from Reuters, uh, the Associated Press. Uh, matter of fact, the Associated Press from, I believe, 1957, there was a news story that stated that uh, hundreds of West Berliners had observed uh, multiple triangular UFOs over the skies over Tempelhof Airport. And it goes into great detail describing this. So you have a multiple witness case. And then as I mentioned, you have the gendarmes and the law enforcement officers. What I also found was a rich history of uh, pilots observing triangular UFOs, uh, both military and commercial. Um, we had a, a famous case in 1954 that was uh, over uh, Labrador, and this involved the British Overseas Airway Cruiser, uh, a complete crew and a complete uh, complement of passengers that had a, a flotilla of UFOs pacing their plane for 18 minutes. And they described it as this large object that kept morphing. They actually called it it was known and actually written up in Fake Magazine back in 54. It was called the Flying Jellyfish. And they called it that because at times it would appear triangular, but then as they would watch it, it would morph and change shape. And in fact, at one point, they said it looked like an old telephone receiver on its back. But um, uh, there was a, a researcher by the name of Leonard Cramp who was very popular in the 1950s, and he did a lot of research 
in that case and described that he thinks that he was actually, they were observing this object from multiple vantage points, and he put together a series of sketches, and in his estimation, as well as the captain at one point, he thinks that what they were observing was a large triangular object that was moving around, but one of the characteristics associated with it was that it had six attendant objects, small little dots that were flying alongside it, equidistant on both sides. And what was interesting about that is there's a lot of cases involving lights or smaller objects seen detaching from or entering into these larger triangular objects. And that was the case in the Belgian wave as well. Uh, but there are, there's a rich history of that characteristic, and that's one of 20 that I identify in the book that when you analyze these reports, there's consistency in the narratives. It's almost as if all these people are describing essentially the same thing. Uh, but then we also have the uh, uh, commercial pilots in 1995 outside Manchester Airport where there was a near collision of a large triangular UFO with a 737. Uh, it was approaching Manchester Airport. It was about 10 minutes from landing. And this large triangular UFO whipped past the right uh, wing and the co-pilot actually stated in his interview he braced for impact. He, he thought there was going to be a mid-air collision and uh, the object uh, continued, they, basically they were opposing each other, their flight paths. Uh, the object continued on, they continued on, they landed safely at Manchester Airport and the Civil Aviation Administration for about seven to eight months conducted an investigation and I have a copy of their report in the book, but basically they said risk unaccessible, source of phenomenon unaccessible, which is kind of like what Debbie and I are used to doing UFO investigations. At the end of the day, usually we're left with a big question mark. You know, we can definitively say what the UFO wasn't, but at the end of the day, we usually can't say what it was. But that gained, the importance of that was it gained a lot of notoriety. And uh, this, you know, this was after the famous Belgian wave. But, uh, so you have commercial, you have military pilots that have seen these things, they're documented in the military files. You have law enforcement officers, and then you know, your average civilians, uh, hundreds if not thousands of people have reported these things. I, um, in writing the book, my goal was to get the information out there, to try to set the record straight, so to speak. And what I didn't realize though, and just in the last few days, I've received some very interesting emails I didn't realize that putting the book out there would facilitate people then contacting me with their reports, and I don't think I was expecting the volume of information. I just had a, a PhD professor from Wales email me about two or three days ago, and he was just beside himself that someone had finally written a book on this because he himself had had a sighting uh, off the coast of Wales, and uh, I'm going to be calling him and talking to him and doing an interview, but he said, my sighting actually occurred around the time that you documented in your book that there was a series of sightings in and around, uh, I believe it was Swansea, if I'm not mistaken, the area of Wales where you uh, lived. So there's a lot of good case information out there, and um, you know the big question is, uh, okay, if these triangles exist, how do these UFOs fit in with all the other UFOs. And of course, I don't have any answers to that. Um, you know, people always ask us, you know, when we do lectures, you know, why are the UFOs here? Where are the UFOs from? It's like, well, I don't know an alien. If they're, if they're an alien technology, I don't know any aliens, so I don't have those answers. But all we could do is try to put the information together, organize it in a coherent fashion. And one thing I tried to do was write this book to where it never read a UFO book in your mind. You can pick this up. And hopefully it comes across as coherent, objective, and level-headed. Um, you know, all of the subjects that we deal with in this, in this phenomenon, from alien abduction to crop circles to UFO sightings, you know, but I've always used the analogy, the, the UFO phenomenon is like mathematics. You're not just going to throw someone a book on calculus and expect them to understand it and digest it. You know, you start off with basic arithmetic, then you go into algebra, and then you can work your way to calculus. And I think for most people that have a casual interest in the subject, they're just asking the question, what are people seeing? What are, you know, tell me, what are people reporting? And so with this book, I really tried to focus on the UFO sightings themselves, trying to you know, identify if there's patterns in the data, which again, I, my conclusion is there is, which is suggested that there is a genuine phenomenon here. And then, you know, hopefully, if this whets their appetite in the subject, then they'll move on and start researching other avenues, other subtopics in the field. Um, but there's been a lot of good case material. Um, 
What I found in many cases, and by the way, there's a lot of uh, local reports. Um, there's one that occurred uh, just north of guys there uh, in St. Louis, uh, in Ellsbury, Missouri, in November of 2000. And I personally know the individual that was involved in this case. And um, he's a retired law enforcement officer, 30 years law enforcement, retired Marine. He was actually reactivated many, many years later, and he had been over in Iraq and Afghanistan, involved in military operations over there in the last few years. Um, and um, he's someone that I know, I've known personally for years. He's actually had previous involvement as a law enforcement officer investigating the UFO from Mountain Hunt. But uh, this sighting occurred in November of 2000. Uh, 10 months after the famous January 5th, 2000 case, and he described this object. I, I, I quote him in the book because, you know, for most people when you read a UFO report, or if Debbie and I or any other investigator that's in the room, you know, will attest, you know, someone says, well, the object was big. Well, <laughs> your definition of big may be very different from what I'm considering big. But the way, the eloquent way in which he described it, I, I think really resonated with me as far as it really conveys the scale of these objects when people report them. He said it like this, and I quote him in the book. He said, Dave, he goes, this object covered the entire field where we were camped out. He said, it was so big you couldn't look at it. You had to look from left to right to see the entire thing. And I don't care how high it is or how low it is, that really gives you an idea of scale. You have to visually pan the sky to appreciate the full size of this object. And, uh, you know, and certainly that is the case with many of these. Uh, the early cases I described from 1880, uh, you know, many of these are from Scientific American, from some of the early scientific publications. Uh, one of them describes the object being 100 foot on its base and 200 feet in length, which again, 1882 we're talking, and now today reports we're receiving describe basically the same shaped object and basically the same scale. So, um, you know, and a lot of people kind of have a bias. They think, well, these objects, they're military. They have to be military. I don't know what they are. And to be honest with you, in the book, I state matter-of-factly in evaluating this for 13 years and putting this together and researching it, I'm sure we're dealing with probably a combination of both. Uh, we certainly have had a lot of declassified triangular military aircraft, and I don't presume to know what the military may have today, but if you have these objects performing these unusual flight dynamics and you have reports going back to 1936 or even 1880 or 1882 then i think we're forced to conclude some but not all of these objects are stamped made in the usa so i think we're dealing with something that is highly unusual i think it's something that needs to be continue to be investigated but the main reason i wrote the book and i think i may have gotten cut off when we were having the connection issue was not just to write a book to write a book but it's, these are the number one reported object if you look at the National UFO Reporting Center and the, the site and report statistics. So as Richard Dolan, my publisher, and of course famous researcher and lecturer on the subject stated, these triangular UFOs, whatever they are, are at the forefront of ufology. So due to their prevalence, due to the dramatic nature of these sighting reports, I felt it was necessary to write a book on the subject, which up to this point has never been written. Um, there was one researcher, by the way, uh, his name's Omar Fowler, and he needs to be mentioned. He wrote two monographs on the subject, and over the last 10 years, since the January 5th, 2000 investigation, I began corresponding with him, and he shared a lot of information, much of which is, is in the book, is in the book. And um, Mr. Fowler wrote two monographs, but we never had a, book -length, a full book-length treatment of the subject. So. Um, it was with his assistance, as well as the assistance of some other researchers, that I put this together. Because certainly, by no means can I take full credit for the book. And that being said, I can see someone sitting in the front row over there, and I want to publicly acknowledge his efforts and work on the book. Mr. Joe Keller, a good friend and great artist. I won't mention him because, you know, this is the first book that I've written. And you put a lot of time and effort into, you know, the guts of putting a book like this together. But it's really important to have a decent face to the book. And without Joe, I wouldn't have a, a decent face to put on this work. So I just want to publicly thank him for his efforts in assisting me with that. He did a, a fantastic job. 
I, I think I've had more people compliment the book cover than the actual book itself. So I don't think that's as easy as you. But thank you, Joe. I appreciate it. And then I just sold two of your books while you were saying that. So. Oh, fantastic. Probably because of the cover art. <laughs> what was the, the smallest and the largest your, uh, triangle shaped craft? Well, it's fun, that's funny you mention that. The, the largest uh, that I've documented is probably 300 feet in length and width, if we're talking equilateral triangles. Uh, you know, people often reference the Phoenix Lights case, and I don't touch directly on the Phoenix Lights case, which of course that was almost a mile wide based on the reward estimates, but I didn't include it in the book because I, for it may seem arbitrary, but I really didn't want to diverge off. I really want to keep focus. So all of the reports I talk about are triangular objects. You start getting into boomerang-shaped objects. In my mind, at least in writing it, I could be wrong, I, I kind of wanted to categorize that separately. You know, there's the triangles, there's the boomerangs, there's the saucer shape, there's the tubular shape UFOs. So I do have uh, Peter Davenport, I believe, in the back of the book, does talk about the Phoenix Lights case. One of the uh, contributing uh, researchers do, does touch on that. But uh, the largest triangle is 300 feet in length, if, if memory serves. Uh, the smallest, and I'm glad you brought that up, Debbie, the smallest involved the famous uh, Rendlesham Forest or uh, Woodbridge incident over in England, where uh, Sergeant Jim Henniston described a very small uh, triangular object in the slithering over the forest floor. And I mentioned that only because uh, I wanted to clearly state that not all of the UFOs fall into this wonderful little mold, that we have these outliers, and Sergeant Jim Penniston's report was certainly one of those. And so the, the UFO that he described was only a few meters in length and a couple meters in height. But I do relay that because, uh, like I said, not all of these are necessarily, uh, you know, these large triangular objects. And then, you know, we get into the nature of these UFOs. I, I did a recent radio interview, and one of the questions asked of me was, Dave, if you're assuming that some of these triangular objects are not military, tell me, what is one of the main reasons why you think, or what is one of the strangest elements that would make you think that these are not military? And one of the characteristics that, again, bears out time and time again, is the fact that many of these large triangular objects while the witnesses are observing them under good viewing conditions, describe the object either disappearing or transforming or dividing into two. One of the common characteristics, and there was actually a sighting like this in uh, West Plains, Missouri, uh, back about 10 years ago, where they saw a triangular object that had suddenly divided into two, which then shot off in different directions. And that bears striking similarities to a Project Blue Book sighting in 1953 over Albany, Georgia, in which case this an F-86 Sabre jet pilot was documented chasing this UFO that had been tracked on radar. And as he, he closed towards the object, he noticed that it was this luminous light source. And at first he thought, well, whatever the radar signature is, this could be a star or a planet until he realized very quickly that as he was accelerating and increasing in altitude, he suddenly realized that the star or planet was now below him, and he was observing it, and he had actually overshot the object. Uh, then, as he began to descend and close on this luminous light source, he said that it started alternating red to white and white to red, and it did this two or three times in rapid succession. And then, as the Project Blue Book file indicates, he then stated that the light then took on the appearance of an equilateral triangle. And he said as soon as he processed this, before he could think or say anything, he then saw the triangular UFO split into two triangles, which then shot off in different directions. Now we have reports of that. In the Ministry of Defense files, there's a number of UFO reports from the mid to late 90s that describes these two UFOs either dividing from one or combining into one. So there's, again, consistency in the reports. When I outline and try to create a profile for these UFOs, if I found one report or two reports, I didn't consider that a pattern. Uh, I think Dr. David Jacobs, who I met last April at a conference, you know, he, he often will state, in talking about the abduction literature, one report does not a pattern make, and I completely agree with that. And uh, unless I see at least half a dozen or more characteristics 
consistently reported over time, I wouldn't consider them a common characteristic. But the ones that I've outlined, the 10 to 20, the 10 primary and then the 10 secondary ones, uh, throughout the literature, throughout decades of worldwide reports, these characteristics continue to jump out of the, the cited reports. And again, there seems to be consistency with regard to that. Um, and then again, uh, one of the characteristics that we alluded to earlier with the January 5th case was the fact that the triangular UFO that was observed, and this is in chapter two of the book, well, what we thought for years, for the last 10 years, was a solitary UFO that was being tracked. There were certain inconsistencies in the testimony that myself and fellow investigator and documentary filmmaker, Daryl Barker, would discuss with each other, but we never publicly acknowledged these inconsistencies. Then we had these additional witnesses come forward with testimony, and it was almost like a litmus paper that we could test the, the veracity of their statements with, because the statements that they made the location of what they described, where they described it, and how they described it, suddenly resolved all these little inaccuracies that Daryl and I could resolve. And it was almost like we had that last piece of the puzzle that kind of fit perfectly in place. And so we had essentially two triangular UFOs operating that morning around Scott Air Force Base, which again, had, we've seen consistency in the reports of that. More importantly, we have reports of triangular UFOs being associated with non-triangular UFOs. If I can real quick, I'll, I'll try to just pull up a quick visual reference, which I think you'll be able to see on the screen uh, fairly clearly. Um, but another testimony came forward, and the gentleman described seeing a rectangular UFO uh, off of Illinois 4 near Interstate 64 with little white lights, or little lights at each corner. And the interesting thing about that I haven't published this yet. Uh, there is a 1984 case of a triangular UFO that was investigated by APRO, or the Aerial Phenomena Research Organization. And it was a 1984 sighting by a mother and daughter of a triangular UFO near their home in the residential area. And as they saw the triangular UFO moving off, they suddenly saw another UFO move into the picture. And this right here is what they sketched. Now that was 1984, they opened Falls. Uh, five years later, one of the Belgian uh, police officers, he was actually a dispatcher, his name was Albert Kreutz, uh, saw a triangular UFO from the balcony of his dispatcher's office. The object then took off at an oblique angle, and he said shortly thereafter, it was replaced by another UFO, and this is his sketch. Wow. So we have two, triangular UFO, two rectangular UFOs with similar lighting characteristics, separated by five years, separated from the United States to Belgium, and we have uh, both reports tied to these things being sighted with triangular UFOs. Then, in January 5th, 2000, we now have two triangular UFOs being reported with another rectangular object, just like this. So, it's really interesting when you start to see these patterns emerge in the data, and again, this was not widely published at the time, so there was no way that this gentleman could have known about these earlier cases. And I might add that some of these reports, I don't think anybody's seen, one of which I'll share with you, because this has a special uh, tie to St. Louis. In uh, the summer of 2005, the uh, UFO study group of Greater St. Louis, who had been around since the late 60s, uh, wanted to find a place to store their files, their research materials, and their books and journals. And they knew about historical research at the time, so they, they let me take possession of the material as long as I would make it accessible to others. And in uh, about three years ago, I was going through my files and I came across a report, and you can kind of see the header there, UFO Study Group of Greater St. Louis. And this is one of their old report forms. And this was uh, of a sighting that supposedly occurred December 19, 1967. So 1967 report. But what really caught my attention as I was going through all these various papers I came across the sighting report was the sketch made by the witness. Now, the sighting was in 1967. The date that the investigator documented and wrote up the report was 1968. So since then, and I think it's pretty safe to say for if there's any UFO study group members in the audience, most of these reports were packed up in boxes and stored away for many years. And these weren't really seeing the light of day for many, many years. They were shuffled from this person's garage to that, or that person's garage and it was never really looked at. But what was most interesting was the object that was reported. Oh, look at that. 
Now, obviously, the triangular UFO caught my attention, but keep in mind, the sighting occurred in December of 1967. You have an object that looks like that. Most importantly, where this object was reportedly sighted was right outside Sky Air Force Base. So we have the same type of object reported decades earlier in the exact same location. This object, and there was a detailed map drawn of where it was sighted, was within one mile of where the Shiloh police officer described seeing his triangular UFO on January 5th, 2000. I mean, there were so many parallels, it was uncanny. And there's been a number of other triangular UFO reports around Scott Air Force Base. Uh, the um, the um, Metro East Journal, for anybody that may be from the Illinois side may remember that, it's, it's been, uh, it's been uh, defunct now for many years, but the Metro East Journal, uh, I actually came across in, in the microfilm at the Belleville News Democrat years ago doing other historical research, I just stumbled across this. It described uh, the, a teacher and several students that had left Beckmeyer High School. Uh, they had just concluded a basketball game, and as they exited the school, the teacher and several of the uh, students saw a large triangular UFO low in the sky and more importantly, they saw, I believe, objects either going into it or coming out of it. And this is very close to Sky Air Force Base as well. But this, I believe, was in the 1960s, if memory serves me. Uh, I think a year or so right before this sighting actually occurred. And then there was another sighting by a teenage couple that was written up in the, I think this was also the Metro East Journal, uh, and it was seen near uh, Bartelsa, Illinois. So they described, interestingly enough, this large triangular object that was pacing their car down a county road, and they described what looked like beams or girders, which is very interesting because that is another common characteristic reported with these objects. Many of these things are not sleek, they're not aerodynamic. And one other little aspect that's interesting too is when you have a triangular object, obviously you've got the little point here, and if you've got a flat base like this, you know, most people think these objects are moving in this direction, with the apex being the leading edge, like most conventional aircraft, like a B-2 or an F-117A stealth fighter. What we often have reports of are these UFOs, and again, if you can bear with me here, I'll try to find a nice little graphic, because I'd like to share this one with you, because this is directly out of the Air Force Project Blue Book files. This is a case from Woodstock, Connecticut, 1967, and this is the sketch from the Blue Book file describing the triangular UFO with lights at each corner, but more specifically, they indicate the direction of flight with the flat end as the leading edge, which I, I discussed this. I had several individuals, some, several uh, aviation experts that I interviewed for the book because I wanted to try to add some credibility. My opinion doesn't matter because I'm not an aerospace engineer, I'm just a UFO investigator, but I wanted to get some aviation experts to weigh in who know aviation, who, who were involved with classified projects. Uh, one of the gentlemen was uh, uh, Professor Paul Allen from England. Uh, the gentleman's 92 years old, and he's probably the sharpest, most intelligent 92-year-old man I've ever had the pleasure of having a conversation with. Um, but he allowed me to interview him for the book, and uh, he has been involved in the aviation industry since the end of World War II. His primary employer was the A.B. Rowe Corporation, uh, for anybody that knows, remembers the Avro car that, that a lot of us UFO researchers are familiar with. He was involved in that company. But then later, he was involved with uh, British Aerospace, British Aerospace uh, a BAE Corporation, and he was involved in their anti-gravitational propulsion technology division, Project Greenblow, back in the early 90s. And he was also an expert on Delta Form aircraft, so I thought this is the perfect gentleman uh, to interview. And so in the course of interviewing, we talked about the fact that many of these have the, the flat end of the triangle as the leading edge. And he just 